and sacrifice the Lamb of God. O Lamb of God, sweet Lamb of God, I love the Holy Lamb of God. O wash me in His precious blood, my Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God. I was so lost, I should have died, but you have brought me to your side to be led by your staff and rod and to be called a Lamb of God. O Lamb of God, sweet Lamb of God, I love the Holy Lamb of God. O wash me in His precious blood, my Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God. Um, the song before the, uh, if you want to go ahead and mark your invitation song tonight, will be number 810, Listen to Our Hearts. And then the song before, that is uh, 810, 810, Listen to Our Hearts. And then the song before the opening prayer and the lesson will be number 801, where no one stands alone. And if y'all don't mind, let's go on and stand for this one. Number 801, where no one stands alone. 801. <clears throat> Once I stood in the night with my head bowed low in the darkness as black as could be and my heart felt alone and i cried oh lord don't hide your face from me Hold my hand all the way, every hour, every day, from here to the grave unknown. Take my hand, let stands alone like a king I may live in a palace so tall with great riches to call my own but I don't know a thing in this whole wide world that's worse than being alone. Hold my hand all the way every
file with me. Heavenly Father, we just thank you again for this opportunity we have to come hear another portion of your word tonight. I just thank you for the many blessings of today, especially the sunshine you've given us today. What a beautiful day it has been, Lord, today. Father, we just pray now for those who are sick, especially be with Robin and Mark as they continue treatments for their cancer. Pray that you would continue to be with them, bless them, their families, and the doctors as they administer this unto them. Pray that you would help them to overcome this dreaded disease. Just thank you for uh, Don's good news. Just pray that you would continue to be with him and help his body continue to heal. And there's those others who had recent surgeries or in the hospital would continue to be with them, help them to regain their most wanted health. Pray for those who be having upcoming surgeries and pray that all these will be successful and be with doctors and nurses that minister to these people. Father, we thank you for the elders here. Pray that you would continue to be with them as they guide this congregation. Pray that they will guide us in a way that will be pleasing unto you. Help them to have the knowledge to do this. Father, also remember those who are shut in. Pray that you would continue to be with them. Help us to meet their needs and whatever they may be. We just pray for their, their uh, young people as they travel tonight. Uh, give them a safe trip. Always let them let their light shine in whatever they may be at, whether at church or at school or wherever they may be. Help them to always be the right example to their friends. Father, we just pray for Trey tonight as he uh, brings us another lesson from your word. Pray that he may speak boldly to us and let us to open our hearts to what's said tonight from your word. Just be with us and pray that all things said and done tonight be in accordance to your divine, divine will. Forgive us when we fall short in Christ's name. Amen. Good evening. It's good to see everybody here tonight. <clears throat> On um, Wednesday nights in my class, we've been looking at uh, different psalms and uh, considering the type of heart uh, that would prompt that psalm to be written and uh, going through each of those passages and then discussing them at length uh, in our class. And tonight is, is uh, I, I want to look at a, a specific psalm, Psalm 73, if you'd like to turn your Bibles there, and uh, just kind of walk through that because I think it's something that would resonate with, with everybody. It's really something that we can all uh, take into our own hearts and, and recognize that it's a, a, a burden to some extent, but also a, a freedom that uh, we can experience especially as we know Jesus and uh, place our trust and our faith in him. Um, <clears throat> it seems like a big void with the youth group being gone to the uh, area wide. So um, when I look out there, it makes me a little bit sad. Make sure we all tell them that we missed them tonight. And I know that it's a good thing for them to go and be with other young people, but we miss them when they're not here. Um, here in, in Psalm 73, what you might notice at the top of, your, uh, of that section is it says that this is a psalm of Asap, okay? This is talking about the guy who, who wrote this. You know, sometimes when you look in the psalms, you'll find that it says, you know, a psalm of David usually, of course, but uh, sometimes a psalm of Solomon. But this one is a psalm of, of Asap. And uh, this fella was uh, someone pretty important at the time. You can uh, maybe hold your finger there and look back at 1 Chronicles chapter 25, and we're told who Asap was, all right? It says, uh, verse uh, 1 of chapter 25, 1 Chronicles, David and the army of commanders then appointed men from the families of Asap, Heman, uh, Judathan, and, and to proclaim God's messages to, uh, to the accompaniment of lyres, harps, and cymbals. And here is a list of their names and their work. And it goes through, then it gives you the names of all the different men, and, and their job was, of course, worship. It was to, to create psalms. It was to uh, lead the people in their worship. And it says you know, in verse 2, from the sons of Asap. This is who we're talking about. They are to direct 
the worship of the people. So this is a pretty important job. And uh, verse 6, it says, All these men were under the direction of their fathers. Remember the first guy names Asap. He's one of the fathers. Uh, they were under the direction of their fathers as they made music at the house of the Lord. Their responsibilities included, of course, playing all these instruments. And then it names Asaph again. And it says, they and their families were all trained in making music before the Lord. And, and each of them, 288 in all, they were a, an accomplished musician. So each one of these people uh, were highly trained and, and ready to, uh, to, to serve God. They dedicated themselves. It wasn't that this was something that they did on the side. This was their job. And so they were dedicating their lives to worshiping God all the time. We have um, people who we refer to maybe as worship leaders, maybe song leaders, you know, but they lead us in our worship of God. And that's who these guys were. They were full-time. This is what they did to bring praise and honor to God. Now, knowing what we know about David and the fact that he loved to sing, that he also played instruments and he was able to, to join in with that, who do you think he spent some time with? He probably spent some time with Asaph with this guy who was in charge of directing the worship. He, he would have been around him, and, and maybe even ASAP. Of course, we don't know. It's, it's, it's not written down how it all worked and, and how the logistics of this would have gone. But surely, as David's writing psalms, he's got to have someone who's an a, a, a accomplished musician to put these things to music. And ASAP would be the guy. He, he would be perfect. Well, in spending that much time with David... Asap probably learned a little bit about him, don't you think? Don't you think he watched? Don't you think he recognized some of the things that were going on in David's life? And wouldn't it have been obvious, of course, uh, with the Psalms that David wrote, when Asap would help him put those to music, for Asap to be able to read between some of those lines? Well, here's Asap. He's a just man. A man who wants to serve God, who's dedicated himself to it. He's not rich. He's the leader of the temple, of the choirs, and of, of all the musicians. He's dedicated himself to God. But he also sees the injustice of the wealthy. He sees the injustice of even his own king. He sees his life. And he knows that King David goes back to a table filled with the finest food in the whole world. He knows that King David, he enjoys this the lap of luxury and here's Asaph, he goes home. His family doesn't have that kind of food. They're not able to, to uh, buy their way to the top in any way. And so at sometimes it had to be discouraging. And I think that's why this is included in the book of Psalms. Here to help us understand, all, all of us regular folks, to be able to look and to see the struggle that this good man's heart went through, which is the same struggle that some of our hearts face also. He answers some very important questions in this psalm. He sees the injustice, and it's discouraging. He's asking, why do bad things happen to good people? And he's also conversely asking, why do good things happen for bad people? He suffers through the stress, the heartache, the loss, the illness, death, all these things that challenge his faith that we all also struggle with that we also face and we recognize as part of living in this world and there's times when all of us because of the moral and physical evil we see around us are forced to ask the question why why and when you go through psalm 73 what you recognize is here's a man who, who's saying is it really worth it is it really worth it to serve god to give my life to god even though i see the rich and powerful living in such a way and here I am in my meager way trying to praise God, but it seems so small. It seems so insignificant. Over in Malachi, the prophet, he's inspired by the Holy Spirit to say something about this. In chapter 3 and verse 14, he says, um, and I'm reading from the New Living Translation in, the, in this passage, you have said, what's the use of serving God? What have we gained by obeying His commandments or trying to show the Lord of heaven's armies that we are sorry for our sins? From now on, we will, care, we will call the arrogant blessed. Those who do evil get rich, and those who dare God to punish them suffer no harm. It's an injustice that 
that Malachi sees that Asaph had seen years and years before. Verse 16, Then those who feared the Lord spoke with each other, and the Lord listened to what they said in His presence. A scroll of remembrance was written to record the names of those who feared Him and always thought about the honor of His name. They will be my people, says the Lord of heaven's armies. On the day when I act in judgment, they will be my own special treasure. I will spare them as a father spares an obedient child. Then you will again see the difference between the righteous and the wicked, between those who serve God and those who do not. He says, well, what, what does it matter? Is it, is it really worth it to serve God? God says, you wait. You wait to the end, and you'll know that it was worth it. When you see the, the things that happen in people's lives and you think to yourself, why? How, how can that be? Why not me, maybe? Remember that God directs us to look at eternity. He directs us to remember all the benefits of following Him and that there is a huge difference. As He points out here in Malachi, there's a big difference between an obedient, faithful heart and one who is living in rebellion, even though they may seem to be advancing in this life, it is not good for them in the very end. So here's the struggle of Asaph, seeing what's happening and struggling with the why. Why? <clears throat> and so let's just consider that tonight and look in Psalm 73 along with me. We'll start in verse 1. He says, Truly God is good to Israel to those whose hearts are pure. But as for me, I almost lost my footing. Asap says, I almost lost my footing. Think about this. This is the worship leader of Israel. This is the man who's directing them, them in worshiping God. And he writes down, I almost lost my footing. I almost slipped because of my experience. He says, my feet were slipping. And I was almost gone, almost lost, for I envied the proud when I saw them prosper despite their wickedness. They seem to live such painless lives. Their bodies are so healthy and strong. They don't have troubles like other people. They're not plagued with problems like everyone else. They wear pride like a jeweled necklace and clothe themselves with cruelty. These fat cats, I love this translation, these fat cats have everything their hearts could ever wish for. They scoff and speak only evil. In their pride, they seek to crush others. They boast against the very heavens, and their words strut throughout the earth. And so the people are dismayed and confused, drinking in all their words. What does God know, they ask? Does the Most High even know what's happening? Look at these wicked people enjoying a life of ease while their riches multiply. Here's Asap, and he says, I've lost my footing too because I got tripped up thinking that the rich and those who were evil, that, that didn't do what was right with their riches, those who were taking advantage of other people, I became deeply troubled because I looked at them and thought that everything was well in their lives. But then he realizes something as we continue to read. He's deeply troubled because he sees the suffering of good and the success of sinners. And he's troubled so much that he almost loses his footing, telling everyone, I I I'm struggling with this. And that's the first key, I think, to our, to our redemption from this struggle, from the thought of why do the rich prosper, or the, the, the evil prosper, and why do we not seem to, is to remember that we are to confess to one another that we're supposed to share it with one another, that we share our struggles, that we bear each other's burdens and recognize that we all struggle with much the same things. So here's Asap, and he's in a spiritual position, a problem, a spiritual problem of being deeply, deeply troubled, and he's allowing even this, this trouble that's come into his heart that he's considering to keep him from seeing the truth. And the reason that he's deeply troubled really goes back to the fact that he's being short-sighted. I think that most of us would agree, especially if we have any years behind us at all, that most of the trouble that we've gotten into is because we were being short-sighted, isn't it? Because we weren't looking at the big picture, because we weren't recognizing that there's more to the story than we actually know right now. So Asap records for us two reasons that almost drove him over the edge. There in Psalms 73 and 
verse 3 said, I envied them. I envied them. His emotional reaction was to envy those who had so much. He was honest enough to admit that he had been affected by envy. He was honest enough to confess the, the, the struggle that his soul was facing at that time. He was bothered that others were living normal, even prosperous lives while he himself was struggling. A, a person who had been dedicated himself, not only himself, but all of his sons, his whole family was dedicated to the service of God. He was being short-sighted, though. You know, in Psalm 56 and verse 8, it says, You keep track of all my sorrows. You have collected all my tears in your bottle, and you've recorded each one in your book. Asap tripped up because he forgot who God really is, that he's a loving father at heart, that he's one who is deeply troubled over our deep trouble. He's one who sees us in our distress and his heart goes out to us. He cries with us. He cheers with us and laughs with us, but he cries with us. He knows the struggles that we face, even those struggles that we bring on ourselves by becoming short-sighted, even those struggles that we bring on ourselves in our own sin of, for Asap, envy. But for you and me, it may not be envy. It may be something else. He says, I know that you're there. Because we, as ASAP, have a limit, limited understanding of how injustices will be resolved. You see, ASAP had his theology all figured out. The wicked deserve punishment, and the righteous deserve peace. Sounds pretty good to me. <laughs> That's not the way it works. That's just not the way it is in this physical world. That's not how it works in the here and the now. God sends his reign on the just and the unjust. We, we live in a world that, that has fallen because of the choices, not only of Adam and of Eve and of Abraham and, of, and every single human being who's ever lived, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, even us today. And so even still today, we see sin around us. And we find ourselves even then struggling with sin, even envying sinners for their sin. And this is a bad theology, isn't it? It's a wrong theology. What he saw in life, he wasn't being able to harmonize with his theology because his theology was in error. It was in error to think somehow that the wicked deserve punishment right here, right now. What he needed to keep was an eternal perspective. And that's the same thing that we desperately need ourselves you see, his resolution comes when he moves from his short-sighted view of God, his short-sighted view of suffering, his short-sighted view of justice, and took on an eternal perspective. Continue reading with me there in Psalm 73. We'll start in verse 13. Did I keep my heart pure for nothing? Did I keep myself innocent for no reason? I get nothing but trouble all day long. Every morning brings me pain. If I had really spoken this way to others, I would have been a traitor to your people. So I tried to understand why the wicked prosper, but what a difficult task it is. Now listen carefully. Then I went into your sanctuary, O oh God, and I finally understood the destiny of the wicked. Did you hear where he went? When he approached the presence of God, when he came into the presence of God, he remembered, he realized, wait a second, this isn't all there is. There's so much more to life than the here and the now. He remembered that he's to be walking by faith, not by sight. When I came into your sanctuary, O oh God, I finally understood the destiny of the wicked. Truly, you put them on a slippery path and send them sliding over the cliff to destruction. He says, I was the one. I almost went with them because of my envy. He said, I started slipping. I was going to be the one who fell also because I envied them. But truly, they're the ones on the slippery path. Verse 19, in an instant, they're destroyed, completely swept away by terrors. When you arise, O oh Lord, you will laugh at their silly ideas as a person laughs at the dreams they had in the morning. Then I realized that my heart was bitter. Can a Christian suffer from a bitter heart? Yeah, we can. Sometimes we let bitterness creep in. 
Sometimes we forget we serve a loving Father. Sometimes we forget and, and somehow take on that, that identity of that older brother that we read about in, in Luke 15. Remember him? He was upset that his father threw a party for the younger brother who had taken all of his inheritance and wasted it. And when his father saw that, that prodigal coming down the road, he ran to him and kissed him, put shoes on his feet and a robe on his back and threw a party. The big brother wouldn't even go in. He was bitter. He wouldn't have anything to do with that, that young guy because he had wasted so much. The father came to him and said, come inside. The older brother said, why would I? What good is it? Is it really worth it? Let me tell you something, it is. We should all strive to be like that father from Luke 15, shouldn't we? To be loving like our father is. To be forgiving like our father is. To be ready and willing to, to reach out to others in love and help them. He said, I realized that my heart was bitter. I imagine... Most of us have had bitter hearts at different times in our life too, haven't we? Most of us from, have struggled with a bitter heart. He says, I was all torn up inside, in verse 21. I was so foolish and ignorant. I'm, I must have seemed like a senseless animal to you, O Lord. Yet I still belong to you. You hold my right hand. You guide me with your counsel, leading me to a glorious destiny. Whom have I in heaven but you? I desire you more than anything on earth. What a wonderful statement to make every single day of our lives, every moment of our life. When you feel bitterness creeping up in your heart, when you feel envy coming upon you, when you see the prosperous of the evil, I hope that you will remember these words and say with Asaph, I desire you more than anything on this earth. No matter how nice those things look, no matter how shiny that diamond might be, no matter how big the house is, no matter how much it seems like others have, you have so much more in Jesus. You have so much more in Jesus. And he tells you, is it any wonder that Jesus says, put your treasures in heaven? Don't put them here. This place, it's all going to be burned up. It's going to be dissolved. There's not going to be anything left. Even the elements will burn up in fervent heat. Put your treasures in heaven. He said in verse 26, My health may fail, my spirit may grow weak, but God remains the strength of my heart. He is mine forever. Those who desert Him, they'll perish, for you destroy those who abandon you. But as for me, how good it is to be near God. I have made the sovereign Lord my shelter, and I will tell everyone about the wonderful things you do. Take an eternal perspective. Whatever it is that you feel bitter about, whatever it is that maybe you've been envying about someone else in their life, remember to keep an eternal perspective, to turn your heart to God, to know that it is far better to be with Him than to enjoy anything, anything in this world. Paul, inspired by the Holy Spirit, said as much in Philippians 1, didn't he? In verse 23, he said, I'm hard-pressed between the two, for to, to stay with you is, is good for you, but to depart and be with Christ is what? Far better. It's far better than anything we might acquire in this world, than any of the riches we might gather up, than anything that we might do. So here's ASAP. And can you imagine the next time he goes to, to sit and play that lyre or that harp or that guitar, whatever it was that he was sitting there listening to David tell him all those stirring words about all the blessings that David was enjoying, that he could sit there with a, a righteous heart, not an envious heart. He could sit there and, with, with this king who had done so many terrible things and yet was still considered a man after God's own heart because not only had he done terrible things, he'd done the right things in repenting. He, he had always turned back to God. And here's Asaph. We don't know all about his life. What we do know is this psalm tells us he struggled. He struggled when he saw how well some who were doing evil things were doing and how bad righteous people were doing, even though they were trying to dedicate themselves to the Lord. I don't know if you've felt that way lately, but I think that this psalm should bring you a lot of comfort. And when you sit next to your David, 
this week or when you talk to them on the phone. I hope you do it with love. I hope you do it with kindness. And, and over time, you're going to get the opportunity, just like ASAP does at the end of Psalm 73, to tell everybody about the wonders of the love of God. To tell them, to proclaim it, and to rejoice. And when those who have so much in this life look at you, who might not have that much in this life, and yet you're so happy, you're so jubilant, you're, you're so ready to spread the gospel, they'll say, why? Is it really worth it to serve God, to miss out on all this? And you can say with confidence, with a faithful heart, absolutely, absolutely, because it's so much better. You know, those of us who've been down to Guyana, it's hard to go there sometimes when you think about how much we have. And when you're in the presence of those who don't have very much, those who live on dirt floors, thatched huts, exposed to the elements all year long, and you come back home in that air-conditioned jet. <laughs> you sit in padded pews at church. You go to a job that pays far more than anyone down in South America could ever hope to make. I want to encourage you. Make sure we're not the ones who have fared sumptuously all of our lives. Make sure we're the ones who have glorified God in whatever state we find ourselves in that he receives the glory for our lives, and that none can ever look at us and wonder why we don't have an eternal perspective, a perspective of, of God completing us in all of his love and all of his mercy flowing through us to a world that desperately needs Jesus. Maybe you're here tonight and you're struggling with envy like ASAP. I want to encourage you, overcome that envy in Christ. Let Jesus work in you and through you to, to relieve you of that burden and to bring you the freedom that only comes from knowing him. Tonight, if you're here and you're not a Christian, obey his gospel. Have your sins washed away by the blood of the Lamb and stand before God righteous, one who is in Christ and looking forward to a great day that's coming, a great day of redemption, a great day where we stand with our Lord and our Savior Jesus and praise God forever and ever and ever. Whatever your need is, why don't you come while we stand and sing.